lucky to have among ourselves one of the most distinguished uh, persons in the field of human rights, uh, Dr. Cassell. Dr. Cassell is not only one of the builders of the international uh, human rights system, but he's also a warrior, a warrior that has not hesitated to put all the weight of, his, of, of the respect that the world has for him to fight the causes of victims of human rights everywhere in the world. Dr. Cassell is also a distinguished and widely published scholar, attorney and commentator specializing in international human rights law, especially in regarding the issues of business and human rights, regional human rights system, international criminal and humanitarian law. He's the president of the board of the Justice Studies Centers of the America, in which he has been to which he has been elected three times by the Organization of American States and is the former president of the Due Process of Law Foundation. Uh, he is going to address uh, as a keynote speaker in this seminar, and we are so happy to have him here. Let's welcome him with a warm applause. Thank you very much, Beatrice. I'm going to ask that you accompany me to all my future design. I'm going to ask you that you accompany me to all my future presentations to give that uh, wonderful uh, novelistic uh, introduction. Um, I want to uh, congratulate the Inter-American Institute for Democracy, the Inter-American Bar Association, and all of the authors of the independent studies in this report uh, for making it possible for us all to be here uh, today uh, for raising important issues that I'm sure will have echoes uh, not only today here on Capitol Hill, uh, but in the, in the future, including the near future. Uh, it is my task uh, to give a, a brief introductory overview, uh, which was largely written for a North American audience. I'm not sure that anyone seated here will hear anything new, but you will at least hear, uh, I think, the sort of message that ought to be heard uh, by people in, in the country where we find ourselves at the moment. Without checks and balances, democracy neither functions nor endures. This is the lesson of history. Absent effective checks on executive power, Democracy tends to descend into authoritarianism and authoritarianism to harden into dictatorship, as we have seen recently in Venezuela. Regrettably, some governments of the left in our hemisphere tend to pursue their ends, whether good, such as benefiting the poor, or bad, such as consolidating a caudillo, at the cost of checks and balances that are especially important for democracy. Among those essential institutions most under attack are independent judiciaries, free and critical media, political dissidents, and social movements. President Rafael Correa of Ecuador, presumably committed to the welfare of his people, appears not to appreciate the indispensable role of checks and balances. To be sure, Ecuador enjoys important elements of democracy. For example, the US State Department Country Report on Human Rights for 2015 acknowledges that President Correa won re-election in 2013 in voting that was, quote, generally free and fair, end quote. The report also recognizes that civilian authorities in Ecuador maintain effective control over the security forces. Nonetheless, according to the report, quote, the main human rights abuses were lack of independence in the judicial sector and restrictions on freedom of speech, press, assembly, and association, end quote, in addition to corruption. The report specifies that judges, quote, reached decisions based on media influence or political or economic pressure in cases where the government expressed interest, end quote. It adds that according to human rights lawyers, quote,
the government also ordered judges to deny all protection action legal motions. I think that's their translation of amparo. <clears throat> to deny all protection action legal motions that argued that the government had violated an individual's constitutional rights to free movement, due process, and equal treatment before the law, end quote. These State Department assessments would doubtless be rejected by President Correa, in fact, they probably have been, as Yankee imperialism unworthy of credence. But similar conclusions can be found in the reports of independent organizations and experts. A serious and credible example is the 2014 report, Independencia Judicial en la Reforma de la Justicia Ecuatoriana, sponsored by three prestigious civil society organizations. The Due Process of Law Foundation, based in Washington, De Justicia of Colombia, and the Instituto de Defensa Legal of Peru. The report's author is Luis Pasara of Peru, a recognized expert and academic in matters of judicial independence. According to the three organizations, the evidence in his report, quote, and this is my translation from their Spanish, quote, clearly demonstrates the, de the deplorable use of the judicial system, specifically the criminal justice system, as an instrument at the service of government interests in contravention of respect for judicial independence and with high costs for democratic institutionality, end quote. The Pasara report analyzes 12 cases of social or political importance in Ecuador. And by the way, I think there's one case at least in there that overlaps with one of the cases in the current report, which were prosecuted after the judicial reform of 2011, as well as some 42 resolutions of the Council on the Judiciary issued in other cases during the same period. The author concludes that their quote, currently exists in Ecuador, a political utilization of justice that seriously compromises judicial independence, unquote. Similar conclusions are evidenced in the current report, the, which in, in English translation is the use of the judiciary to violate human rights in Ecuador, sponsored by the Inter-American Institute for Democracy and the Inter-American Federation of Lawyers. The report presents six case studies. According to the sponsoring organizations, these criminal proceedings were used by Ecuadorian authorities to, quote, harass, intimidate, persecute, silence, and prosecute students, indigenous persons, people who denounce corruption, business owners, and political dissidents, end quote. The six cases are summarized by their respective authors in the text of the report, and we will hear from a number of them later this morning. Uh, and by the way, I invite all of the authors in, to uh, advise me of any corrections that may be needed. Uh, I read these reports, I attempted to extract some very brief summary points, but I may have made some mistakes and I would welcome any corrections that the authors might observe. Uh, I do not pretend here to summarize either the cases or all the violations of due process. <clears throat> it suffices simply to highlight some of the violations in order to illustrate the excesses that appear to have been committed. Now the six cases. In the case of the 10 of Luluncoto, 10 young people were arrested during a meeting. According to them, the meeting was for the purpose of planning their participation in an indigenous march for water, life, and dignity of peoples. The prosecutors alleged a different motive, an attempt to organize terrorism. However, when the arrests took place, the prosecutors had not identified any specific criminal charge. Worse, in spite of the apparent absence of individualized evidence against the majority of the youths, they were all ordered into pretrial detention, one for three months, seven for nine months, and two for a year. The criminal proceedings then lasted four years, 
In the end, the National Court of Justice dismissed the charges with prejudice. If there were truly evidence that the youths participated in terrorism, is this result credible? The case of Sebastián Ceballos involves a political dissident who, in a series of tweets, disclosed a list of relatives of a high public official, all of whom held government jobs. One tweet stated that Paula Rodas, a niece of the high public official, held her government job, quote, effectively, her uncle is the minister of employment of his family, end quote. The implication was that she had gained her position thanks to her uncle's political clout. But she responded that in fact she won a merit-based competition to earn her position. She filed a criminal complaint against the tweeter for the crime of making, quote, expressions in discredit or dishonor against another, end quote. The tweeter was convicted, fined, and sentenced to 15 days in prison. Nonetheless, once the sentence was, was confirmed, Ms. Rodas pardoned the tweeter and asked that the case be dropped. In order to avoid prison, the tweeter accepted the arrangement and the court approved it. Both this proceeding and the precedent it sets are troubling. It would have been possible to respond to the tweeter with a public denial or a demand for retraction or clarification or even a civil suit for defamation. But to criminally prosecute for a tweet that implies something negative, but perhaps mistaken about a public official, is disproportionate and threatening to free expression. For example, Principle 11 of the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression, approved by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, declares that, quote, Public officials are subject to greater scrutiny by society. Laws that penalize offensive expressions directed at public officials, generally known as desacato laws, restrict freedom of expression and the right to information." End quote. In this case, a different law was used to penalize the criticism, but free expression was equally violated. The effect of such criminalization can be to intimidate those who dare to criticize public officials on the internet. Another political dissident, Francisco Daniel Endara Diaz, uh, Daza, perdón, was sentenced to 18 months in prison for the crime of, quote, paralyzing public services, end quote. In the absence of evidence of his direct participation in acts damaging the property of Ecuador TV, on 10 September 2010, when there was a sort of police uprising against President Correa, Mr. Indara was convicted for, quote, applauding, end quote, the demonstrators. The unacceptability of both his conviction and his punishment speaks for itself. In another case of, quote, paralyzing public services, end quote, the case of the 29 of Saraguro, an indigenous group blocked the Panamanian Highway, the Pan American Highway. Two of the demonstrators were sentenced to four years in prison. Again, the disproportionality of their sentence is obvious. <coughs> the case of the seizure of the television media, TC Televisión and Gamma Visión, was justified on the basis of criminal cases brought against the effective owners of the media enterprises. At first, both the Prosecutor General and the Supreme Court found no basis to prosecute the owners. In response, President Correa, as well as various legislators of his party, publicly declared their disagreement and demanded the dismissal and sanctioning of the judges. The new judges, amenable to Correa's political forces, sentenced the owners to eight years in prison. Upon examining the case, the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations condemned the seizure of the television properties as a violation of due process. However, despite the dissenting vote of committee member Yuval Shani, the majority did not consider the public statements about the case by President Correa 
to constitute undue interference with the independence of judiciary. With all respect, I believe that Dr. Shani, and not the majority, was correct. In Ecuador, when President Correa speaks, judges listen. This reality was demonstrated with equal clarity in the sixth case, that of the students of Central Technical High School. Twelve students of the school were among 600 students demonstrating against the change of name of the school proposed by the Ministry of Education. The prosecutor in the case decided not to bring charges against the 12 students for lack of sufficient evidence of their guilt. The judge agreed. Two days later, President Correa criticized the decisions of the prosecutor and judge. He insisted that they were afraid to rule against the students in the face of media pressure. The events were not a simple social protest, he declared, but criminal acts. As long as he remained president, he would not permit this kind of behavior by, quote, muchachos desubicados, end quote, which I have had some difficulty translating, but I've translated as boys acting out of place. <laughs> Two days later, the provincial prosecutor revoked the decision not to prosecute and took the 12 students to trial. They were then convicted of rebellion. In other words, by his public declarations in this and other cases of political interest, President Correa has effectively converted himself into the highest court of appeal in Ecuador. Now a note of clarification. <clears throat> in order to analyze violations of due process, it is neither necessary nor relevant to determine the innocence or guilt of the persons being prosecuted. For example, the seizure of the television media, TC Television and Gamma Vision, was justified on the basis of criminal charges, criminal cases brought against the owners. There are accusations of corruption against the owners, concerning which I am not sufficiently informed to express an opinion. Nonetheless, for purposes of this report, this does not matter. Even on the assumption of their guilt, bearing in mind the presumption of innocence, there is no justification for violating their right to free trial, fair trial. <coughs> and now, two caveats. The studies in the current report appear to demonstrate violations of judicial independence, as well as the politicized use of criminal trials. However, two caveats should be mentioned. The first is that the authors of some of the studies are the defense lawyers for the accused. This fact diminishes the appearance and possibly the reality of the objectivity of the studies. Nonetheless, even with this limitation, the reports present evidence which is prima facie convincing of irregularities in the trials as described above. In addition, these studies should be evaluated in the context of other reports by diverse organizations which also criticize the lack of judicial independence in cases of interest to the government in Ecuador. <clears throat> the second caveat is the absence in the report of a response from the state. In the judgment of this writer, it is preferable that reports on violations of human rights in a country, if feasible, invite the observations of the state and include them or at least a summary in the report. I don't know whether there was an invitation made in this case. However, in spite of these caveats, the current report is a valuable contribution to public debate about the politicization of justice in Ecuador. In conclusion, the six cases in this report should be cause for concern by everyone committed to judicial independence and to justice free of politics in Ecuador. One hopes that the report may be read, pondered, and debated in Quito. Thank you for your kind attention.